Yeah, good morning, everyone. And it's really a great pleasure and honor to introduce our friend, Peter Love. He's uh, in the physics department at Tufts University. Peter involved in developing and applying quantum information, quantum computing methods for quantum simulation from the early days, I would say almost about 20 years ago, with seminal contribution to the field. He showed us in his early work how to map the Schrodinger equation from first quantization into the qubit space and how quantum chemistry can be done in a quantum computer. And we had an opportunity to work with Peter about 10 years ago when we have the first NSF center in quantum information and quantum computing for chemistry. And I will add uh, his contribution was both to the adiabatic model of calculations at early days when people used D-Wave and later with the gate model and now with the NISC machines, how to apply all these new algorithms for quantum simulations. And maybe I'd like to add, Peter is, not, is a theorist, but he also involved in major experimental development. For example, the ion trap experiment at uh, Duke and many experiments at Sandia National Lab, at Berkeley and many other places. It's really a great pleasure to have you, Peter, here. And today he's going to talk us about quantum simulation of quantum field theory in the light of front formulation. Peter. Great. Well, thank you for that very nice introduction, Sabri. So it's always nice to uh, be at Purdue. I was thinking I was last at Purdue 10 years ago. Uh, I remember flying there from Haverford and it sort of shows, you know, the, the British ignorance of American geography. I, I thought it would take a lot longer to fly to it, Indiana from Pennsylvania. That's why I was really surprised when it only took two hours to get there. Um, and I also remember eating an extremely nice rack of lamb in a French restaurant there. Which then I think you told me it's the only French restaurant. <laughs> oh, yeah, we so have a few more today as well. Oh, okay. <laughs> so um, I realize the purpose of today's uh, talk is a bit different than usual. It's really just to distract you from CNN or 538 or whatever you're looking at for an hour so you can think about uh, physics and quantum information for a while. Um, so I'll do my best to be entertaining. Um, I just wanted to draw attention to my background here, which is here, just so you can't um, see my basement. Um, but this is actually a picture that we made for the Center for Chemical Innovation that Sabra and I were involved in uh, a long time ago. Uh, so it's supposed to be a depiction of some orbitals with a quantum circuit over the top. Um, it's actually a photograph that a very nice student of mine at Haverford by Dick Assurance. All right, so let's get on with it. So let's talk about the NISC era, sort of where we are in terms of quantum computing right now. And I think the really important distinction to draw is between quantum computers which have error correction. Um, there are no such uh, real machines available right now. You can't run an algorithm on a machine that has error correction in, although there are a large number of error correction experiments that are getting more and more and more impressive. Um, and the, all the other machines, which are the ones you can get access to through Google and IBM and all the various DOE centers, um, which do not have error correction. And that means that the, the noise, which of course is the uh, vulnerability of any quantum system, the fact that interaction with the environment essentially measures the system and degrades the quality of the quantum state, eventually that will just destroy your quantum state. And so you're stuck in this funny position where you have, suppose you have on like on the Google machine, you have about 53 qubits. Um, you can do about 20 layers of random gates as they did in their supremacy experiment. You can't simulate that in a reasonable amount of computational time classically. And yet we don't have any uh, useful applications of machines at that scale. Um, so that's sort of what we call the noisy intermediate scale quantum era. And I'm just using this uh, graphic that I pinched from IBM. This is their roadmap. And, you know, they're really talking about going up to a thousand noisy qubits in the next, I guess, two years, really. They never put, they never say whether they mean the beginning of 2023 or the end of 2023. And also with these roadmaps, you usually have to add at least two years to the, to the dates. But in any case, this schedule 
certainly 10 years ago when I last came to Purdue, this would have been an absolute fantasy, I think. So the field has sort of moved forward a lot, both in terms of what's been accomplished, but also in terms of what we can expect going forward in the next five years. So that's the sort of NIST gearer. So I'm going to talk about both uh, algorithms that can be used for both types of computer in this talk. Um, and I want to start with the work that Sabro was re referring to, which is the idea that uh, quantum chemistry is a particularly nice application for quantum computers. So this was my first paper I wrote with Alain asper back in 2005. So that was the start of an extremely enjoyable and long collaboration and friendship. Um, and this is the figure that we made uh, with various molecules in various basis sets. And the purpose here, it's difficult to cast your mind back 15 years, but at the time there were no quantum simulation algorithms known that would use a smaller number of qubits than Shor's algorithm, but which were very, very likely to be hard classic. And so that was the purpose of this figure was to say, look, all these points uh, labeled by A, B, and C here lie below a thousand qubits. And the sort of amusing way of saying that is that if you have a thousand logical qubit, meaning a thousand qubits with error correction, a uh, quantum computer, that's not big enough to run Shor's algorithm on interestingly large keys. And so that's a quantum computer that, you know, as a uh, innocent research scientist, you might be allowed to actually use because they know you can't use it for any nefarious purpose. You can't run Shor's algorithm. And so that was the start of a, of a sort of journey that is ongoing, but I always like to invoke history here and look back to the classical use of classical computers in quantum chemistry. And so here's a picture of SF Boys in Cambridge in 1950. And here's the, his paper where he's doing what was really, I think, the first uh, full CI calculation for a beryllium atom. Um, and that's the EDZAC vacuum tube computer. And so really we've been, we're in this era where we have these noisy and reliable machines. It's very, it feels very analogous to the vacuum tube era of, uh, of classical computing. All right, so how do we do that? How do we, sim how do we, what are the steps in simulating a quantum chemical system or any fermionic system on a quantum computer? So the first step of course is to map fermions into qubits. Um, we typically do that in some kind of occupation number basis. So we have a basis of orbitals that makes quantum chemistry problems very attractive because there are hard problems with small basis sizes, meaning a few hundred basis uh, functions. Um, obviously, then we have to worry a lot about fermionic statistics. And so in the simple-minded approach we took in this paper from 2005, we use the Jordan-Wigner transformation, which puts the anti-symmetry into the operators and lets you write down a Hamiltonian that is isospectral with the, um, with the fermion Hamiltonian. We then go through the sort of three, uh, the three-legged stool or three-ring circus or whatever you want to call it of uh, quantum simulation algorithms. In a quantum simulation algorithm, you always do some state preparation at the beginning to prepare your initial state. You do some time evolution because either you're interested in a dynamic quantity or you're doing phase estimation, you're interested in a static quantity, which means we're going to use the phase estimation algorithm, which is the workhorse algorithm in quantum information. Phase estimation operates by, guess what, doing a lot of time evolution. So it's always a slight paradox that to calculate static quantities on a quantum computer, you have to do a lot of time evolution. And then at the end, you have to do some digital readout of the um, of the energy eigenvalue. And so that's really the approach that we proposed here. This, by the way, is would definitely require a lot of error correction and a lot of difficult things. Um, so what I'm writing down here is not a NISCI approach by any means. Another question is, um, in order to have an efficient simulation, you need to be able to represent the Hamiltonian of your system in some if, in some efficient way. I mean, if you think about the ham arbitrary Hamiltonians of n qubits, those are two to the n by two to the n Hermitian matrices. So if there's no structure to that, it's not you can't even write the thing down in a, anything less than an exponential amount of time. So there are two natural ideas of an easy Hamiltonian, meaning a Hamiltonian you can use as an input for some calculation. And the first one is locality which is a very natural thing to think about um, if you think, ever thought about spin models in condensed matter. Um, 
This just means that the Hamiltonian is a sum of terms and each term is local, meaning it couples a bounded number of qubits. So typically in condensed matter models, you would think about coupling pairs of qubits, or if you're thinking about something exotic, maybe triples or quadruples. Um, in fact, in the mappings we use for quantum chemistry, we get mappings which uh, have logarithmic locality. So they couple a logarithmic number of, meaning a number of, uh, a number of qubits which is growing with the total number of qubits, but only very slowly, only as the logarithm of the total number. So that's the local mapping. And then the other kind of mapping is to say, well, or the other kind of representation of a Hamiltonian you might have is a sparse representation. So these are very familiar if you've ever done any, any uh, large, large scale uh, classical linear algebra calculations, it's very often a good idea to use a sparse representation in Mathematica or whatever. Um, in a sparse Hamiltonian, you really have two uh, functions that define the matrix. One function tells you where the non-zero entries are, and the other function tells you their values. And so provided that in each row and each column, there are no more than a bounded number of non-zero entries, you can efficiently describe this exponentially true matrix. And so over the uh, years, uh, we now have simulation algorithms suitable for large-scale error-corrected quantum computers that use both of these approaches. All right, so what about NISC? What about today when we have dirty quantum computers with no error correction in them? Well, the natural idea is that we have extremely powerful classical computers, so we want to have an algorithm that uses both, both the classical and the quantum algorithm together. So the input to a NISC variational algorithm is typically some kind of ANSATS quantum circuit. So it's a description of a transformation you can do on the quantum computer, uh, which has angles and things like this, various variables put into it. And that's something you hand to your experimentalist friend and say, please run this and make a measurement. So then your nice experimentalist friend sends back to you, says, oh, well, I, I ran it three times and here are the, here are the bit strings I got back. Um, so you just get samples back. So that's a very important uh, thing to remember. We're so used in our quantum mechanics classes to calculating wave functions, but quantum computers do not calculate wave functions. Quantum computers measure uh, states whose probability is predicted by the wave function of a computer. So you only ever get samples. So then I take these samples away and put them in my classical computer. And typically I use them to calculate some expectation value. Let's just say we're calculating the expectation value of the energy. The variational principle tells me that that expectation value will be an overestimate of the ground state energy. So then if I am clever, I can extract some extra information from my um, initial measurements, adapt the parameters in my ANSATs and variationally minimize my estimate of the energy. And so this is a algorithm that was really created out of, well, I like to say it was really created out of despair because we were in about 2010, we got into a lot of discussions with ex our experimental colleagues about little demonstrations we could do. And it turned out that our definition of little and their definition of little were not quite the same. And so anything that involved phase estimation was out the window. And so then um, Jared McLean and Alberto Peruzzo uh, and our collaborators uh, put together this paper, um, which has both the algorithm and the experiment. And I should say that it's not just for eigenstates of quantum mechanical Hamiltonians that you can apply this kind of variational approach. Um, Eddie Fahey and Sam Gutman and Jeffrey Goldstone uh, around the same time created the quantum approximate optimization algorithm, um, which applies a similar kind of variational approach to classical objective functions. So problems in combinatorial optimization like travel and salesman and various problems on graphs. I would say the difference there is that um, for those problems, because they're NP-complete typically, um, you, what the interest there is is improving bounds and trying to come up with some bound that shows that this quantum algorithm is better or gives you a better approximation to this thing. So there, um, but that's a whole other area. So these two types of variation algorithms, that's really what uh, at the moment most of the energy in NISC devices is focused on. Okay, so let me just put some equations around those words. So 
all our mappings that we developed when we were thinking about in phase estimation for molecules, what comes out at the end is a Hamiltonian on qubits, which is a, a linear combination of Pauli operators. So those are tensor products of Pauli matrices and the identity. Um, at this point, you can download Open Fermion from Google and learn in about an afternoon how to generate these Pauli Hamiltonians on qubits, given some um, given some information from a quantum chemistry package like PySCF or Sci4. Actually, it'll probably take you a week to figure out how to connect Open Fermion to Sci4, but then it'll take you an afternoon to do the actual quantum stuff. Um, and then we, all we do is we variationally minimize the expectation of this Hamiltonian by variation by estimating the terms separately. Um, and then we minimize this sum. Now, because I know there are a, probably a bunch of quantum chemists on the call, it's worth reminding ourselves, what would the classical analog of this be? Well, the classical analog of this method really would be an RDM approach where each, you separately minimize each of the reduced density matrices that's in the support of these poorly operators PI. And something that's extremely well known in chemistry is that you have something called the representability problem, which is you're not allowed to just willy nilly optimize every reduced density matrix independently. You have to make them obey a hidden constraint, which is that they should arise from some global quantum state. Um, classically, that's very hard. It's formally known to be just as hard as solving the problem in the first place. Obviously, that's an area where there's a lot of chemistry expertise. And in fact, um, those kinds of end representability uh, constraints are being used, particularly by Google, to reduce the um, amount of quantum computation they have to do. So there's a, an, and now there's a nice dialogue. Um, Nick Rubin, who works at Google, wrote his thesis on end representability problems at Chicago. So he's a real expert on that stuff. So uh, Hobbes said that life is nasty, brutish, and short. Uh, probably he was just talking about life in England at the time. But um, that's really what VQE on this device is. It's a dirty business. There's a lot of errors. Um, you can't expect always to get what you want. Um, so, you know, as I say to my daughter, you get what you get and you don't get upset. But nevertheless, um, we've managed to do experiments or various, we and many other groups working very hard on this have managed to do uh, experiments on photons, which was the first experiment in the top left. Superconductors, there's two. The top one is an experiment by Google and the bottom is an experiment by IBM. Um, the one on the right is an iron trap experiment that was done in Innsbruck. And as Sabri mentioned, we now have this very nice stack project where we're hoping to build much larger scale iron traps and really push, uh, push forward with the iron trap approach for this. Uh, there was also a cover article uh, in science from the Google group, which is very nice to see. Um, and uh, so this is really a very lively and interesting area. But you know, it's a bit crowded, to be fair. <laughs> so uh, there are many issues with VQE that we're all working on hard. And a funny thing happened at the end of 2019, which is we were all working very hard to reduce the number of measurements. And I think there were six or seven papers, maybe more than that, that came out. And I think those papers came in pairs. So I think almost every idea you had about measurement reduction was independently discovered by two groups. So we were all sort of scooping each other left, right and center. And when that happens, it's a signature that you should really go off and try and think about some other problems. So in the meantime, I had got kind of interested in this problem, this question really of why is it that quantum chemistry is very appealing and has these nice um, hard but small instances that one can throw at a quantum computer Whereas every, every time I hear someone talk about lattice gauge theory or doing lattice gauge theory on a quantum computer, the qubit requirements seem to be so daunting that it's really very off-putting. And so the question was, can we take anything that we learned in quantum chemistry and apply it to simulating quantum field theory? There's a, a kind of sociological component to this, which is I moved to Tufts in 2015. Tufts has a very large and active high energy physics group. And um, I actually moved offices after my first year because someone retired. And so I ended up sitting smack bang in the middle of the high energy physics folks. So all around me in the environment, suddenly there was all this talk about neutrinos and 
colliders and all this kind of stuff. So perhaps I got slightly infected by that. And uh, that was kind of inspiring this work. But the, let's just say why off the bat you, you, you think this is a terrible idea to transplant ideas from chemistry to field theory. Uh, so, you know, a, a crude but not a crude but accurate statement is that chemistry is about systems of fixed particle number. You know, that's what defines what an atom is, is how many electrons it has. Um, we've said many times the basis representation is a very appealing feature of quantum chemistry algorithms. And certainly in quantum information, predominantly we've been focused on calculating static properties, meaning trying to solve the electronic structure problem. Uh, we do have algorithms for dynamics and scattering, but they 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 require more qubits and gates at the moment, so uh, they're not so relevant to experiments. So now we jump over to, to field theory, and almost the first thing you learn is that if you have a relativistic theory where you have E equals mc squared, and you have a quantum theory where you have delta E delta T is bounded below by some number, you have you have processes like pair production. And so if you try to make a relativistic theory with a fixed number of particles, you'll run into all sorts of difficulties, just like you do with the Dirac equation. Um, that, of course, doesn't mean you can't have a cutoff somewhere in occupation numbers, but you know you should imagine that you're always going to have states that are superpositions of different numbers of particles. Um, typically, uh, field theory, numerical approaches to field theory use a grid as a lattice, a grid as a regulator. So then you're doing lattice gauge theory or something like that. And finally, every time you talk to a particle theorist, they seem obsessed with cross sections. They just want to compute cross sections, which is a dynamic scattering problem. And so, so you have both a different approach, you have conceptual problems, and you have a different set of targets. So what I'm going to try and do today is persuade you that in spite of these initial thoughts, there is actually a very interesting set of questions to ask. So of course, we were not the first people in this area. So here are two very, very nice papers uh, if you're interested in reading. Um, some really foundational work on this stuff. Um, so the, uh, the two approaches that one has. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, so it's a rule about Zoom calls that we have to have some form of interruption. So my daughter's at school, so she can't interrupt. So it has to be, you guys have to do the interrupting. Um, okay, so the two approaches, the first is you can discretize the field configuration itself. And then you have you know, the, the natural picture of a quantum field, which is a superposition of different classical field configurations. But of course that implies a cutoff on the uh, field value uh, to make the Hilbert space finite. It's still extremely large. And then the second one is that uh, via something called quantum link models, where essentially you integrate out gauge fields and you, what you end up with at the end of the day is a very complex spin model. But actually, that's, not, that's, not, that's pretty good because that's really what we get in chemistry as well. We get complica very complicated spin models that represent electronic structure problems. But as I said before, you know, if you're trying to represent a system that formally has an infinite number of degrees of freedom, um, you should expect that your number of qubits that you're going to need is going to be rather large. So we, we um, th this may or may not be fair, but we sort of pick on this 20 qubit grid calculation for a 3 plus 1 quantum chromodynamics that was proposed in a, uh, a paper by Lam and collaborators. Our estimate is that calculation would require 400,000 qubits. That's 400,000 logical qubits. That's too many, just to be <laughs> clear. Um, you know, we may be looking at having a million or so physical qubits in the lab in 10 years or more. But you have to remember that if you want, a logic, want to make a logical qubit, you need to build a logical qubit out of many, many, many physical qubits. So the idea of having half a million logical qubits is really very distant. So that was the starting point, was to say, well, we know some things about chemistry, let's, about simulating chemistry. Is there anything we learned relevant to this problem of reducing the number of qubits? The other thing we learned by talking a little bit more to our high energy colleagues was in fact, um, in high energy physics, there are static quantities that are extremely interesting to compute. Um, so in particular, at the Large Hadron Collider, uh, you collide protons, which are composite particles. Um, 
And so whenever you think you're colliding two protons together, which happens at some ridiculous rate at LHC, um, re in reality, what's happening is that two constituent quarks or partons are interacting. And you don't know in detail what those individual partons were doing inside the, the protons in which they live. So in, every, in any calculation, you have some statistical uh, information about what on average a, a parton in a proton is doing. And that's captured by something called the parton distribution function, which just tells you what's the probability that I see this particular quark um, with this fraction of the proton momentum. Um, this is a quantity you calculate by uh, really heroic uh, classical computation efforts. But it's important to know that the LHC is moving into this era where the precision of their measurements is going up and up and up. And so the uncertainty in the theoretical calculation of the part on distribution function actually can dominate in the uncertainty budget for a number of important measurements. Um, so we, that's a very interesting thing to learn from our wonderful high energy colleagues, because that's a very, that's a static property of a composite object, just like the electron energy, the electronic energy is a static property of a composite object for a molecule. And then, of course, you know, what's the first thing you would do? You would Google basis representation quantum field theory. And if you do that, you, what you find is this very nice paper by Ken Wilson uh, from 1990, where he's explicitly thinking about this question. I mean, Ken Wilson was the inventor of lattice gauge theory, um, among many other things. And he was really explicitly thinking about this question of why do chemists not use lattices and what, why do we use lattices? And um, some of you may know, Ken Wilson's father was E. Bright Wilson, who was a quantum chemist, who he actually wrote this rather nice, oh, you can't see it. <laughs> so he wrote, wrote, wrote this rather nice book about molecular spectra. Um, so, you know, Wilson obviously went off, he actually talks in this paper about writing code in C++ to do electronic structure calculations. And um, in that paper, contained in that paper is a suggestion that perhaps the light front formulation or the infinite momentum frame formulation of field theory could be a good place to go uh, to construct basis representations. And so that was the start of this project really, which I've managed to get to halfway through the talk. Okay. So the origin of the light front formulation goes back even further to Dirac, this paper by Dirac in 1949, um, in which he says, okay, if you want a fundamental theory, it has to have two properties. It has to have a relativistic invariance and it has to have a Hamiltonian formulation. It's a kind of amusing historical note that this paper is, I, I can't remember if it's just slightly before or just slightly after Feynman's first paper on um, path integrals, formulations of quantum mechanics. So at the time of writing Dirac, nobody knew that there was a path integral formulation. So he really, and if you look at what Dirac wrote in this period, he was clearly obsessed with Hamiltonian dynamics and really believed that if you could really understand Hamiltonian dynamics very, very well, that that would take you to a theory of quantum gravity. There's a, he famously has this very thin book of lectures on quantum mechanics, which is all about Hamiltonian constraints. Okay. And if you have one, if you have a rel relativistically invariant system, what does that mean? It just implies that your coordinate systems are related, coordinate systems related by Lorentz invariance are equivalent to each other. So given a particular coordinate system, all Lorentz transformations of that coordinate system give you an equivalence class. But that doesn't mean that there's only one equivalence class. And so what, what um, Dirac worked out is that there are in fact three equivalence classes of coordinate systems. One is the one that we know very well, which is called the instant form, or Dirac called it the instant form. Um, that's where you formulate your theory by defining all your variables on a space-like surface. Okay, So we all live on a space-like surface moving forward in time. Never mind that it's impossible for us to communicate at the same time with someone uh, another point on the space light surface, we have to wait until we interact with some future point where our light, our future light comes into the But nevertheless, we, that's how we construct our theories. The front form takes an opposite point of view, which is it says, well, 
or a different point of view. It says, well, in this theory, I have light fronts that are moving through space-time at the speed of light. That's what this angled plane is supposed to be. So let me just put all my variables on this light front and let it just go. So that so those are the surfaces on which our variables are defined. And so now instead of t and z, I have ct plus z and ct minus z as the light front time and coordinate. And then there's the point form, which I'm not going to talk about. Um, there is some work on the point form, but for what I'm talking about, the front form makes things more simple. It seems like the point form makes things more complicated. So that's why we're not going to talk about it. But it's an interesting point that we usually think, you know, in, uh, in relativity, you're taught that there's no Lorentz transformation that boosts you up to the speed of light. So here, it seems like there's something wrong here. I'm, I'm defining a theory where all, of the, all the observers are uh, presumably massless and moving around at the speed of light. Um, the only thing you need, though, is you need to be able to define a Lorentz transformation that relates the state of motion from one observer to the state of motion to another observer. So let's, let me just tell you what that is. So Lorentz transformation just leaves this uh, interval invariant x squared minus c squared t squared. So the light front position is x minus ct, and the light front time is x plus ct. Um, for some reason, I've chosen down indices on this slide. But just by trivial algebra, you can see that this interval is the product of the position times the time. And so how must Lorentz transformations act on the position and the time if they leave this product invariant? Well, it's very easy to convince yourself that they have to just multiply the light front time and the light front uh, coordinate. And so that means Lorentz transformations are diagonal in the light front. And so they're just a scaling of the, the position and the coordinate. There's no mixing of the, of the coordinates, which is a very kind of simple um, appealing feature of these coordinates. OK, so that's just a little bit of relativity. Um, what do we do next? So we wanted to start with a, a simple but definite model. So we chose this. Uh, you can tell this is a story about field theory because now there's a Lagrangian on the slide. But this Lagrangian actually is uh, pretty simple when you think about the physics. The first two terms here, this field phi, is just a free scalar boson field. Okay, So this is something you would quantize. You would get a whole bunch of harmonic oscillators. Then the next two terms are a free Dirac fermion. So if you only had this, your equations of motion would be the Dirac equation. You would just have uh, electrons running around. And then we have a Yukawa interaction that couples the free boson to the free fermion in this particular way. Um, so this is called a massive Yukawa model uh, because the bosonic, uh, the, bos the bosons, which you should think of things like photons, have a mass. Um, so this is just a toy. Um, but just so that we can talk about defi a definite model. So now if we quantize this, what we find is the total energy charge and momentum are conserved. So charge conservation just comes from the Dirac part of the Lagrangian, so that follows exactly uh, through. Um, and so then if we think about quantizing um, in an instant form, i.e. doing a conventional quantization, we're going to get a Fox space um, which has occupations of momentum states for the fermions, the antifermions, and the bosons, um, which, are, which we write down in this slightly opaque notation. So let me just take a minute and go over this. So N1 here, this is a fermion momentum. So N1, I have N1 momentum. And then M1 is the occupancy. So the superscript here is the occupancy. Now this is a fermion, so M1, excuse me, so M1 can only be um, uh, zero or one by Pauli exclusion. Now N bar is of course just the antiparticle. So here I have N1 bar is the momentum of this antiparticle. And again, it's occupation because it's a fermion uh, can only be zero or one. And then over here with the tildes on top, these are the bosons. So then I have N1, which has, M1 uh, 
bosons in it. And those, of course, can run over any uh, range that's consistent with the cutoff. Because we're going to do, try and do a simulation of this, we have to cut off our occupancies at some level. But now we run into this issue that I know momentum is total momentum is conserved. So I want to put myself into a total conserved momentum subspace. But then in, I'm in one plus one dimensions here. So I can make up my fixed equal time momentum uh, by having an arbitrary number of left moving particles and then canceling their momentum with another arbitrary number of right moving par particles. And so then the Fox space, even at fixed momentum, is clearly infinite. OK, and so that's kind of a problem, uh, because what it means is that when I cut off my momentum states, I actually introduce an error in the Hamiltonian, because I have to cut off some coupling to some occupation states that are perfectly consistent with momentum conservation. And that, just very roughly speaking, means I've got to make this cutoff very large in order to make the error in the Hamiltonian small. And so to get accurate results, I need large cutoffs, and that's going to lead me to these um, bad qubit numbers. So now let's think about the same question, this business of making up a fixed amount of momentum out of a particular occupation state of momentum orbitals in the light front picture. So the light front picture here, I like to uh, use this example of Einstein riding his bicycle. This picture is all over the place when you visit Caltech, and it's because Einstein didn't know how to ride a bicycle before he went to Caltech in the 30s. He actually learned. So these pictures are not Einstein riding a bicycle at Caltech. They're Einstein learning to ride a bicycle at Caltech, which is kind of, a, I never knew until last year. Um, so if you think about this picture as representing a light front observer moving at the speed of light to the left, and then you imagine that observer looking at all the massive particles in your theory, Obviously, all those particles are moving to the right because none of them can be moving at the speed of light. So they all have to be moving away from your light front observer. And so um, what that means is that they all have light front momentum, which has the same sign. Okay, And so then you no longer have this problem of I have fixed light front momentum but I can make that out of a whole bunch of right movers with positive momentum and a whole bunch of left movers with negative momentum in any way I want. I only have positive momentum. So I can take that total light front momentum and I can partition it among positive light front momentum in only a finite number of ways. So for fixed light front momentum, you get finite dimensional subspaces of the Fox space. And so in which you can uh, solve the theory exactly. And this is 1 plus 1d, remember. So we'll get to 3 plus 1 in a minute. OK, so let's go back and look again at our little uh, toy model here with the free boson, the Dirac fermion, and the Kawa interaction. So what out of all this, what we get is a variable called the harmonic resolution, which is just a dimensionless light front momentum. So you should imagine we're quantizing our system in some box. So we have plane waves. Uh, plane wave eigenbases, and then we have this, which is just counting the total amount of light front momentum we have in the system. And the computationally important thing about this is that it plays the same role for the algorithms that, say, electron number plays in chemistry. Electron number partitions up the by the electronic structure handle. It's the total number. But it plays the same role uh, for the algorithms that the electron number plays for chemical systems. OK, so again, we just use the same picture. Um, uh, the um, we can scale things so we're only ever using our harmonic resolution as the size of the problem or the representation of the size of the basis. Um, and so now what I should tell you, I should give you some physical meaning for this number k because it's so important. Um, in a relativistic theory, of course, you can define something called the Compton wavelength, which for a mass 
a party called mass M is you're just putting all that mass and in, mass into energy and then the photon with that energy has has the wavelength which is the Compton wavelength so that's a natural way of associating a length scale with a particle um, remember I said we were quantizing these systems in a box and the harmonic resolution which is a dimensionless number is just the ratio of the box size we use in our box quantization to the Compton wavelength. So it's the number of Compton wavelengths we have in our computational domain. So it's really a resolving power in a kind of Heisenberg microscope kind of sense. So you should expect that as you go to sectors with higher uh, harmonic resolution, higher light from momentum, that you'll see more detailed features of the theory emerging in those sectors. Just like if you look at a chemical system in a larger basis, you can see more fine and more accurate details of what's going on. Okay, so let's think about uh, some simple particles that can emerge in the theory. Um, so if I think about uh, just picking states that have a particular, uh, what we call valence structure here, so we have a particle and antiparticle. So you can think of that as being like a quark and an antiquark. So a particle made of a quark and an antiquark is called a meson. Um, those particles are stuck together with some number of bosons that they're exchanging. Um, and so we can count up as we go to increasing K, all the different particles of this type that we can see, all the different Fox states of this type that we can see, I should say. So at K equals two, there's obviously only one such thing a quark with momentum one, an anti-quark with momentum one. At k equals three, I have these three states. And as k goes up, there's more and more and more ways of making particles like that. These, of course, are eigenstates of the non-interacting theory. And as we switch the, switch the interaction on, the eigenstates of the mass matrix, which are the particles in the interacting theory, will become superpositions of these FOC configurations. So if I have a meson at k equals three, there'll be some amplitude to observe it in this state and some amplitude to observe it in this state and some amplitude to observe it in this state. And those, that structure is, of course, what the information that goes into the PDF. You know, the, the relative amplitudes of these things tell me the probability of seeing a quark or an anti-quark with momentum either one or two. And that's exactly what the PDF uh, that's exactly the information the PDF encodes. So that's the thing we want to compute. So we have this picture. Uh, the picture on the left is typically what you, what gets drawn, but the, what's really happening is you have some complicated composite particle and the thing that's interacting is one constituent of that. Um, and so the question that the PDF answers is what's the probability that a given constituent carries a fraction of the light front momentum? It is a useful fact uh, that has been known for a very long time that in the light front picture, uh, observables like the PDF um, have very, very simple forms. And so these are things that can be computed on a quantum computer relatively easily. They really, again, to make an analogy with chemistry, they can be computed with a similar, similar amount of effort that you would do to calculate some one body observable in chemistry. So it's really, um, a nice, uh, a nice target for calculations. All right, so this was um, all preamble, but now we want to start counting up how many qubits we might need for this little toy model. Um, so to do that, we have to ask how big is our Fox space? Uh, very roughly speaking, if I take an integer harmonic resolution, say 100, then I can partition that momentum among my momentum orbitals in any way I want. The way that causes the largest number of occupied orbitals to be present is the states in which every momentum state carries one particle. And so this is the these are the worst case states. I've got to store all states like this. So I've got to count how many of these there are. Um, what that means is, so I've got to store i different occupied orbitals. I use a qubit register to store the occupied orbitals. This is exactly the same approach that's used to store the CI matrix for quantum chemistry calculations using the CI matrix. 
Um, and so if I count these up, k has to be the sum of all these indices up to i. So k goes like i squared. That means the maximum number of occupied orbitals that I have goes like the square root of k. So that's rather nice. So it goes um, sublinearly in k in 1 plus 1d. Now that's counting my qubits. What about counting my gates? Well, the great thing about the light front, I'm just extolling the virtues of light front here, but the important thing from the point of view of counting gates is that the Hamiltonian in this basis is sparse, meaning that the number of uh, non-zero matrix elements in the Hamiltonian for fixed K grows like K squared, okay? Uh, and remember that the dimension of this thing is exponential in the square root of K. And so, that, so we can specify this Hamiltonian efficiently and we can use these marvelous new methods that have been developed by Andrew Childs and Dominic Berry and Robin Cathari and Nathan Weeb um, and many other people, which scale almost optimally, meaning optimally up to logarithmic factors um, in the input variables. So the things that a quantum simulation algorithm depends on are the norm of the Hamiltonian. Um, we can just use the max norm, which is just the largest matrix element, which in this case scales again like K. Um, they scale with the cost of finding and calculating the non-zero matrix elements. Again, in this case, that costs us, that has a cost growing with linearly with K. And the remarkable thing about these methods is they scale logarithmically in the inverse error. So they scale like the number of digits of precision you need in reproducing the time evolution operator, which is truly, truly remarkable property. And these are the references here. So, um, so we, the great thing is, is that, that we can just use these, these kind of maximally efficient uh, things. And the only work we have to do is in two and three, um, which is bounding the max norm and um, finding and calculating the matrix elements, which for this model we've done uh, in our paper. And one other thing you might want to do is do adiabatic state preparation where you're turning on interaction slowly. Um, and again, uh, thanks to this paper by Berry Childs, Sue Wang and Weeb, uh, you now we again have methods that scale just with the total adiabatic time big T. All right, so that's one plus one D, you know, so what? The world is three plus one dimensional. So we want to ask what's the difference between one plus one and three plus one. The difference is, is that now you have these transverse directions, um, the things inside the, the light front. Um, and so because now uh, particles that carry the same light front momentum can be distinguished by these other momentum variables, you no longer have this worst case behavior where you're filling each one up. Uh, one at a time. Um, so in one, in more than one dimension, uh, or with particles that have other quantum numbers, you're going to get a scaling of qubits uh, with k that is linear, okay? And then with some logarithmic dependence on k and on the momentum cut off in the transverse direction. But still, this is pretty good. So it's still linear in k up to logarithmic factors. Okay, so now let me tell you the punchline, or the first punchline. Um, if I go through and just count carefully what I need for full-blown quantum chromodynamics um, in uh, three plus one dimensions, uh, and I compare against this 400,000 qubit number, which remember is a 20 cubed grid in three plus one QCD, um, the number that comes out of our estimate is 1360. So that is uh, two orders of magnitude improvement, um, but maybe we can just say it's smaller than 400 now. Um, so that's good. So this really shows at least that this idea isn't failing at the first hurdle. Um, it really does seem to deliver us the, the better representations that we were hoping for. Okay, so I'm not sure how much time to leave for questions. Maybe five minutes. Uh, five minutes. Five, okay, great. So in the last five minutes, I want to tell you all of this stuff. Okay, I'm talking about 1360 qubits with 
uh, many thousands of gates. Obviously, this is work that one could only perform on an error-corrected life scale on a computer. Um, what about things we want to do today? Um, we don't want to wait for 10 years and not do anything. So there is a um, an approach to uh, field theory using the light front, which uses a basis, instead of just using a basis of momentum orbitals, it uses a basis which is symmetry adapted to the problem that you're thinking about. So if you're thinking about a meson, let's say, maybe it has axial symmetry like the hydrogen molecule does. And so you choose an optimized basis that, that gives you a better representation. Then another thing you can do, if you want to take one more step in the direction of phenomenology, is you can use an effective field theory model uh, as well. Those are independent choices. You could use a BLFQ basis in the full QCD Hamiltonian, but for what we, for these first calculations, we did a uh, we did both. We chose an effective field theory, uh, an a, approximation to QCD called the Nambu uh, Jonas Lacinio model, uh, which is a very old and well studied thing. Um, and so that gives you a very efficient representation of QFT. And with our collaborators at Iowa State, we just uh, we decided to reproduce a calculation that they had just done classically, which is for the light meson. So here's the, here's the paper. So what we do is we restrict to the valence sector. So that just means that in our Fox space, we only have uh, one quark and one anti-quark. Uh, we only have one momentum coordinate, which is the relative momentum coordinate. So this is just like what you do, you know, in lecture 12 of an introductory quantum mechanics class in physics, it's probably lecture two in chemistry or something, but, um, and so then we have it using an effective Hamiltonian um, where this NJL Hamiltonian is a, just like in chemistry again, is a four point interaction between fermions that has the same symmetries that QCD has. So any property that only depends on the symmetry should be true in NJL as well. Um, and then we have, so we have effectively a free Hamiltonian that we solve analytically, or not we, our collaborators have solved this analytically. That gives us the basis. Uh, just like solving for a basis of orbitals in hartree fock And then we use that basis of orbitals to define the full problem and solve the full problem. Um, and just NJL is actually two people, not three. So after all that, um, you end up with this four by four matrix uh, in units of MeV squared. And the two lowest eigenvalues uh, of this matrix correspond to the masses of the pi plus and rho plus mesons. Um, again, this is an approximation. This is the simplest test bed problem you could imagine. Um, we use in our, we use a VQE calculation, which we do both in a direct mapping and in a compact mapping. Um, the direct mapping has four qubits and 16 polyterms, and the, the compact has two and five respectively. And we just throw it on the publicly available IBM machine. And what we do here is we minimize the uh, eigenstates of the mass matrix. So we're going for the lowest mass particle in the interacting theory, which should be the rho plus. Um, then once we've obtained those optimal ansatz parameters, then we want to go back and compute some other properties. Um, after all, you can measure the particle mass. You can look it up in the particle data group. And you know that. So uh, one thing you might be interested in is the charge radius of the particle. Now you know the particle's mass and you know how big it is. This is, you know, it's a very simple particle. thing. And so here are the results for the direct and the compact. And you always have to remember when people show you NISC results that, you know, firstly, it always astonishes me we can do anything with a quantum computer uh, that you can just access over the internet. And secondly, what you're learning from this is you, you're learning at least as much about the quantum computer you're using as about the system you're trying to simulate. So one of the things we can learn here is the green bars on this plot, this is, these are bars of error, so more is bad. Um, the green bars are without the error mitigation that IBM provides, and the red bars are with error mitigation. So you can see that the error mitigation is working for the compact encoding because it's a rather small circuit. 
But in the direct encoding where the circuit's bigger, you're not really getting um, very much bang for your buck because the errors are not dominated by measurement errors anymore. Um, you can see we're getting sort of 10% accuracy in the compact encoding. Uh, and if we look at the way the errors are scaling with the number of measurements we make, they scale as one over the errors, one over the number squared, which is uh, what we expect. That's a basic property of VQE that just comes from the statistics. Uh, these are the errors in the mass of the particle. For compact and direct, we can see quite clearly that compact is better. And here we see something interesting, which is that the charge radius accuracy, so our estimate of how big the particle is, is much better than our estimate of the mass, which is kind of comical because we chose to, you know, we optimized our ansatz for the mass and we didn't do so well. We did about 10% in the compact mapping. But here we're doing much better in the charge of the particle, which is an illustration that, you know, the, the, the accuracy depends also on what the observable is, of course. Okay, so I'm two minutes over. So let me just stop here. Um, another thing about VQE is you have to be very clear about what is being done uh, as a first demonstration and what is the first step towards something that could provide you with quantum advantage. So here in the relative coordinate basis, um, there's really no path to uh, quantum advantage there. You have to include every single particle basis in the next step and then introduce multi-particle interactions. And there, so there is where we can really uh, start thinking about trying to push up to things that classical computers might struggle with. And then the first part of the talk is all multi-particle ab initio. So there we really have a path to quantum advantage, but the machines are a little further in the future. So here are the references. Um, this number three will be out, I promise, pretty soon, uh, before Christmas, maybe before Thanksgiving. Um, and let me just advertise a few things. If you're interested in this work and want to join us, please, uh, undergrads, please consider applying to the graduate program at Tufts. Uh, postdocs, please just do get in touch with me directly. And we're currently searching for a computer science faculty member in quantum information at Tufts. And so if you could draw this job ad to the attention of anyone who's, uh, who might be interested in that position, that would be wonderful. And, uh, there are our wonderful collaborators in the, this is in back in the days where we could go places and sit together. So thank you very much for your attention. Hey, thank you, Peter. This is really exciting to see new and fresh ideas into this field of quantum simulation. Now we'll open for <laughs> questions. So please turn off your microphone and ask questions for Peter. Any questions? Hmm. Maybe waiting for questions. Yeah, Sanchul, are you asking? Yeah, yeah, I have some question. My yeah. name is Sanchalo. I mean, uh, I'm sorry, I cannot fully understand your talk. Uh, but I mean, quantum field theory also extensively used in conventional physics for describing superconductivity electron hole pair. Can you apply your method to solving such a problem? Yeah, so, so well, I think I think there's two pieces to the answer to that. So one of the things that we've had to wrestle with here is exactly this mapping from some second quantized Hamiltonian that has bosons and fermions and different particle types in, to then go from that to having a a quantum circuit that simulates it or an ANSATS state preparation. And certainly that part of the work is is very relevant for the problems you're talking about in condensed matter. Um, uh, uh, a question that I think is um, perhaps a little bit out of scope for what we're thinking about is um, whether the light front formulation of field theory is useful in condensed matter. Um, it's sort of natural in fundamental physics where of course you have a speed of light, but you know, in condensed matter systems, you do also have a, a finite Lee Robinson velocity, for example. And, and so I, do, I just don't know if anyone has pursued that, um, but I, I would, you know, I think those are papers that I am very unlikely to write, but would really love to read. Okay, okay. One more, one more question. I mean, sure. in quantum field theory, usually we are dealing with Lagrangian, not Hamiltonian, right? Yes. yes. And uh, high energy physicists or quantum field theorists uh, calculate a partition function. 
right? Yeah, yes. some calculating action, exponential action, and, and the calculate uh, expectation value. So some people use, uh, mon uh, I mean, uh, calculation part function uh, correspond to integral of some function with a high dimension, right? So some, uh, some Monte Carlo method were used to sample uh, such a function. I mean, I mean uh, how can we simulate Lagrangian dynamics? On, uh, on well, uh, this well, is a um, big question, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 I think that's very interesting. Um, and, you know, I think, uh, I do think it's very, a very good direction to go in to think about other formulations of dynamics apart from starting from a Hamiltonian. I mean, the approach we have here is we write down the Lagrangian and then we, you know, we follow the light from literature in deriving a Hamiltonian from that. And, and one of the advantages or one of the things that attracts us to the light front is it gives you a Hamiltonian formulation of field theory. And so, so that's really we're going all in on the idea that, you know, you should, you should start as Dirac told us with a Hamiltonian formulation as your starting point. But that, you know, that doesn't mean that uh, we wouldn't love to see, you know, some way of simulating quantum systems that starts directly from the Lagrangian or directly from the Green's function or something else. Um, we just, yeah, you know, we just don't at this point know. I would say there's been a lot of work in quantum simulation algorithms recently, meaning over the last five years, where people are, are, are learning to simulate functions of the Hamiltonian. So you can write down, for example, a quantum circuit that represents e to the i arc cosine of the Hamiltonian. It's sort of a fairly typical thing. So, so, so the spectrum of things you can do is actually wider than what I've talked about here. Okay, thank you so much. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, maybe Peter, just a general question. I mean, from your experience with the new implementation for the field theory, do you, uh, going back to quantum chemistry simulation, do you see any new like a tricks or things we can use to improve our algorithm in the quantum chemistry field? Well, do you know, one of the things that's happened is because for this work, we've had to get very serious about these sparse methods. Mm -hmm. um, we're sort of, we're, we've been really working hard to understand in detail these optimal simulation methods. And one of the things that's come out of that is trying to use some of those tricks, which are really for, you know, let's assume a perfect quantum computer, um, to try and use some of those tricks for NISC machines. So we have a paper that, again, is on the cusp of coming out that uses uh, some of these more advanced techniques for implementing unitaries not to do time evolution, but to do measurement reduction in VQE. And so that's been very, that's sort of, uh, so I, I think that that sort of inspired us to try and look for, to bring, you know, more sophisticated tricks from quantum simulation into the NIST era. Um, and I think that's a great direction to go. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so if no, okay. Sorry. Yeah, I have one question actually. Um, so uh, suppose uh, the main idea is to transform the second quantized Hamiltonian uh, into, suppose if you want to simulate that Hamiltonian into a quantum computer, you transform the Hamiltonian into X, Y, Z, or identity, this kind of four local or two local form, right? Uh, in, yeah, in, yeah, in the direct mappings, yeah. Yes. So uh, what I'm trying to understand that, okay, so it actually grows uh, with the number of particles, right? I mean, I'm talking about the scalability. So is it scalable like your formulation? For example, uh, suppose there are three particles, there could be three X, Y, Z uh, kind yeah. of like, so, uh, so what is the problem with the scalability or is... Yeah, okay, there... this is a great question. So... Um, so the, the lowest, uh, interact, the, 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 the smallest locality Hamiltonians we can produce for fermions mm -hmm. are via the bravi kitayev transformation, mm -hmm. uh, which gives you, um, locality scaling logarithmically with the number of qubits. And so that's scalable. 
Oh, um, that's oh, that's that's uh, great. Yeah. So, um, and the but the other interesting thing to know is that even if I have like in Jordan Wigner, I have this. Um, I have locality that just scales linearly with the number of qubits, which seems disastrous. Yes. Um, yes. In fact, in fact, when you do trotterization, you can evolve under one n local term with a gate cost that only scales linearly with n. So actually evolving under these very, very high weight or high locality poorly operators, that's mm -hmm. a very native, um, that's a very native operation for a quantum computer. Um, yeah. So that's a, so it's, a, it's a an interesting point. And, and then uh, when you're in the sparse domain, of course, you're not thinking about these kind of locality properties anymore anyway. Thank you. Okay, so if there's no further questions, comments, uh, please join me again for thanking Peter for this interesting talk. And thank you, Peter, for. Great. Thanks for having me. Thank you.